over 60 years ago, this New Zealand team strode out to do battle with England in our first official test here at Lancaster Park. They lost by eight wickets in just three days, but we had achieved test status, and with that began a cricket history full of highs and lows, some controversy, but a lot of characters. It had been 36 years since the first national team was chosen. The opponents were the Aussies, this time in the shape of New South Wales. The venue, Lancaster Park, the result, a resounding defeat. In those early years, we truly were the novices of world cricket, and our lads took a lot of stick from the Australian and English greats that toured here. Players like Victor Trumper, for instance, who were this very bat, used to pound the pickets wherever he went. The bat was autographed by the 1905 Australian tourists and presented to the New Zealand Cricket Council immediately after Trumper had thrashed 172 runs off the New Zealand bowling attack in just over two hours at the Basin Reserve, where it's now housed in the National Cricket Museum. Our crowds were privileged to see such great teams, but New Zealand did have its heroes too. Dan Rees was an all-rounder who captained his country and played top cricket in both Australia and England. And later, Hawke's Bay's Tom Lowry, who in 1927 led a fine bunch of cricketers on a 38-match tour of England. Lowry, who had toured New Zealand with the MCC while a Cambridge University student, led the team to seven first-class victories and paved the way for test status. They were very popular with everybody, including the press. When, we, uh, when I played in, in England, the press chaps used to come along and say, please, uh, you know, what do you think? And, <laughs> When I went back in 1927, um, I, I uh, thought the same rules applied, but they definitely had changed in those three years. And uh, somebody heard me uh, uh, describing to one pressman what I thought of him, and they said, you can't say that nowadays to the press. So we, you better give them a cocktail party at the Savoy, and we had a marvellous press after that. <laughs> The team included legendary figures such as Stewie Dempster, who topped the batting averages, all-rounder Roger Blunt, the first New Zealander named as one of Wisden's five cricketers of the year, dashing batsman Cess Dacre, who was soon lost to county cricket, and Bill Merritt, an 18-year-old spin bowler who took an incredible 107 wickets. And so we came to test status, but it was to be 26 long, hard years before success was finally achieved. However, cricket supporters did have many great performances to savour. Dempster recorded our first test century in a 276 run opening partnership with Jack Mills, who on his debut also scored a century in the Basin Reserve Test against England. The following year, Tom Lowry's team were introduced to Test Cricket England style. His Majesty the King receives a great ovation from the crowd when he comes to see the Test match at Lords between England and New Zealand. And it was Dempster who also scored our first test century on foreign soil in the opening test match at the home of cricket. It's Dempster batting, 49 not out in the second innings. There's his 50. The second 50 of the match. Dempster, 96 not out in the second innings. There's his hundred. A very great inning. With Dempster in the record books, interest centred on double all-black Curly Page as lunch approached. Page playing Allen. 99. No, he couldn't get it. He couldn't get it there. It was time for a nervous chat and a whiskey with fiery England fast bowler Bill Vos, and it was decided then the first delivery after lunch would be a no ball. I said, you won't, will you? And... Uh, he said, yes, I will. So down came this ball, and I gave it an enormous swish and missed it. But then the next ball came down, and those uh, bowled it right at my feet, and I just pushed it away for a single up to mid on, and uh, that was 100. <laughs> <laughs> Page 99 not out, playing Vos. There's his 100. Very sharp one to mid wicket close in.
Dempster averaged almost 60 on the tour and continued to play for New Zealand until 1933 when he returned to England to play county cricket for Leicestershire, whom he later captained. It was said he was so revered that the boat which took him to England delayed its sailing so he could complete his last test match. This gate at the Basin Reserve serves as a reminder of his rare talents. New Zealand cricket turned another corner with the 1949 tour of England. The team, led by Walter Hadley, held England to draws in all the four test matches. With no cricket in the war years, the team was very inexperienced. Only Hadley, bowler Jack Cowie and batsman Merv Wallace and Martin Donnelly had toured England in 1937. Already they've been practicing at Lord. Walter Hadley, of course, has since become the patriarch of our greatest cricketing family. Yeah, well done. Nice to see you. Yeah, Come in. I'd love to. I'd love to. Thank you. Now we had a, a very a good sort of bonhomie. You know, we we're all friends together, and I think the secret of the tour, and it was very successful, was that we all wanted one another to do well. And uh, I set targets on the ship going to England. Um, targets like um, winning half our games outright. Uh, I looked for 15 wins, we got 13. I was looking for a century per innings from uh, one or other player in the team, for the team, mm -hmm. not for themselves, but for the team. And uh, we had 29 centuries in, in about 30 matches. And a lot of good partnerships. Uh, you know, it was, it was a well-knit team. I've no doubt that other teams since have been uh, much the same, and you know, and their friendliness, and looking after one another, but we did have that, and uh, it, it's never stopped ever since then. The individual highlight of the tour was Donnelly's double century in the second test, a first for New Zealand. Brilliant weather and the popular New Zealand tourists brought huge crowds to Lords to see the second test. Early on the scene was the MCC president, the Duke of Edinburgh, who met the rival captain. England's opening was slow, and early blows included the loss of Robertson, who went to Cowie. The heat wave brought out all the latest in headgear. Evans was soon bowled by Burt. On the third day, Donnelly's 200 was welcomed on the BBC by Roger Blunt. Last ball the over. To this day, his score of 206 is the highest recorded by a New Zealand number five batsman in Test cricket. And he was 126 not out of stumps. And then the next day, he simply massacred their bowlers. I mean, Trevor Bailey was a good bowler by any standards, and uh, he had five men on the boundary. Mm. Give you an idea, you know, how Martin was plastering them, hitting them all over the place. I'm a truly great player. Mm. The tour may be Walter Hadley's favourite cricketing memory, but I'm sure he'd prefer to forget this. Gladwin was missed by Hadley. Oh, Butterfinger! But the inevitable draw proves once again that our visitors are deserving of at least four-day tests. But one young player on that tour was not all that concerned. The three-day test then, we thought that was the greatest against what we thought then was the greatest country, cricket playing country in the world. So uh, what more could you ask for? You were virtually the boys amongst men when you got over there. Right. Not the way it is today where the chaps are playing so much cricket in so many countries that uh, a tour is just another tour. But this was a tremendous occasion. And we played so much cricket comparatively that uh, uh, I played 49 first class innings, which was the equivalent then five years of cricket in New Zealand. They were playing alongside Martin Donnelly, for example, the first time. He was my idol, right. you know, and, and uh, I used to look at him and think, oh, I, I can never bat like that. Right. Well, neither I could either, because he was Donnelly and I was me, and, 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 and that was it. But just to have him there, um, and people like Merv Wallace and Walt Hadley, great mentors, uh, you know, and they've, we've been great friends ever since. And the baby of the team remembers the tour as a great learning experience. It was still rationing in, in England in 1949, and we, we used to get the wives, and I wasn't married that stage, of course, but mothers used to send over cake and this sort of situation. We'd sit around our hotel rooms and, and uh, talk cricket. 
how do you play an off spinner? You know? What's the next bowler going to do? Is it ball moving? You know? where, do you, where do your feet go? I learnt all this uh, from our own team. Magnificent. The talented left-hander Martin Donnelly was resident in England at the time, having attended Oxford University from where he represented England at Rugby Union in 1947. He now lives in Sydney. It's often said that cricket is a character-building game, and the New Zealanders who played South Africa at Alice Park on Boxing Day 1953 needed all of theirs. The Tangiwai disaster in New Zealand on Christmas Eve claimed 151 lives, including the fiancé of New Zealand's young fast bowler, Bob Blair. Naturally, the grief-stricken Blair was unable to take his place with the team on the second day of the test. South African fast bowler Neil Adcock showed no signs of pity as he launched a ferocious attack. Several New Zealand batsmen suffered, including Bert Sutcliffe, who was invalided to hospital, but later returned to the fray. One of the chaps in the dressing room came along, he said, here, drink this. And he gave me about a five-ounce glass of scotch. <laughs> right. So I drank it. <laughs> and I had not the slightest feeling. Uh, I think, I suppose the whole system was so numb at the stage. So eventually, when uh, the wicket did fall, you know, that's, that's uh, when I went out and for some reason I thought, oh well, I'm not here to hang around and the first, I think the first or second ball from Tayfield I hit went over the fence. Well, the crowd went wild at that lot, you know. And seven sixes later they were still going wild, <laughs> you know. Uh, and it was, it was just one of those utterly stupid things. When the ninth wicket fell, Suckliffe headed for the dressing room, but then Bob Blair emerged from the tunnel. We are all in a state of shock, and I'm not afraid to admit now, and I've admitted it before, that um, uh, I cried when he came out. And uh, so did 11 South Africans and two umpires. Mm. And, and as, as Bob walked out, there was just a complete hush over the ground. It was almost eerie. I'm at the other end and I'm wanting to get out of it all. And then suddenly he swings the bat and it goes over the top. Well, you should have hit. That's when the place erupted. Right. You know, and that's the way it stayed until we finally, uh, we finally got out. And, um, and that's the way it happened all the way back to the, to the pavilion. But it's a day that never should have been. At the end of that traumatic day, the team were not thinking too much about runs and wickets. Their thoughts had reverted to home. New Zealand cricket's growing pains continued on March 28, 1955. It was a day best forgotten. They came, they saw, they conquered. Len Hutton and his team outwitted the Aussies and demolished New Zealand in the second test at Eden Park, Auckland. Thousands of grandmothers died and a record 18,000 saw the famous English cricket team in action. After trailing England by only 46 runs, hopes were high for a positive result as we went into bat on the third day. A terrible Tyson to Sutcliffe. One Christchurch cricket enthusiast even boarded a plane for Auckland to witness the event. He need not have bothered. The whole ground went numb. And uh, I think the score was 16. And I was fifth out and I had 11. So I walked, I walked off the ground and um, went in, had a shower, got changed. And I'm just putting my tie on because in those days you weren't allowed to sit in the stand without being properly dressed. Right. And I'm just putting my tie on the last pair walking. And it was all over. By the same afternoon. <laughs> Quite an incredible situation. And this is how cameras of the day captured the nightmare. Here are the killers in slow motion. Statham. Tyson. Wardle. Appleyard. If only they could have been slowed up. New Zealand all out for 26 makes test cricket history of the most ignominious kind. As the debacle developed, silence fell on Eden Park and over the whole of New Zealand. And the headlines said it all. But Bert Sutcliffe still sees the funny side. And certainly, uh the name will be in Wisdom, I think, forever and a day. I don't think we'll ever get below that, will we? I, I hope not. I hope it's not another <laughs> New Zealand side, anyway. <laughs> not while you're batting, anyway. <laughs>
But in cricket, as in life, there's always another day. And that day was March 13th, 1956. New Zealand gained their first test victory by beating the West Indies at Eden Park, with the fall of the final wicket coming after tea on the fourth day. And now Cave comes in from the scoreboard end to bowl, and he stumps, he's out, the test is over. The win was a cartoonist delight. New Zealand's captain that day was John Reid. Three cheers for John Reid, you can hear down below. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll get over to you in a minute. There's so many cheers going on down below, it's impossible to hear. And it was a good West Indies side with uh, Sobers in it and Weeks in it and um, uh, Ramondon and Valentine, those sort of guys. So it was a pretty good side. We made a plan to bowl with four medium paces. Harry Cave, Don Beard, I think it was Tony McGivern and myself. We were all bowling fast medium stuff. <clears throat> and. Um, uh, we tied them up with that. The plan worked from that sort of situation. And um, no, we had, a, we had a very good win and it was very much needed for New Zealand cricket. And of course I was thrilled to, uh, to, to have, a, to have a, a win um, in my first season as captain. So it was for the very first time that a New Zealand side actually knew the joy of pulling out the stumps with a winner's smile. And these were those very stumps. However, it was six years before we tasted success again, but it was a big one, our first victory overseas. John Reid made 92 and Zinn Harris was our first century maker for seven years as New Zealand totaled 385. Well, Zinn Harris, who was in devastating form. He hammered everything loose and reached his century. The fielders got tired of him, but the crowd didn't. And when he was out for 101, he left the arena to a standing ovation. Good bowling by Jack Alabaster and Frank Cameron set up a decisive advantage. It was the beginning of the end. South Africa was set 408 to win. Reed's men were not to be denied. As Burke loves sparling straight into the hands of Motts, who almost swoons with delight. Alabaster bowled Athel McGinnon round his legs. The final curtain fell when Lawrence was out, and the jubilant Kiwis won by 72 runs. Congratulations to John Reid and his men, the first New Zealand team ever to win a test match on foreign soil. I think that, that first win overseas, and this tour of South Africa in 1961-62 in did a tremendous amount for New Zealand cricket. The confidence of the public had in, at least we had someone to match the All Blacks who won a match occasionally. It was a, a magnificent performance from a, from a New Zealand team who, without too many stars in it, um, but uh, they were tremendous team spirit. And I think after 1949, the 1961 team was the, uh, was the, was the team I'd most like to have a reunion with. So I'd like to get that organised, fellas. And it's no wonder he wants a reunion as he headed both the bowling and the batting averages in that drawn series. What a tower of strength the New Zealand captain has been. All bowlers are Canterbury lamb to him. The achievements of John Reid and Bert Sutcliffe, often in losing teams, cannot be overestimated. New Zealand achieved three test victories in Sutcliffe's era, but incredibly he was absent each time. Of course, I've always said then that as soon as I stopped playing, they started winning. <laughs> but I'd played 42 tests at that stage right. here, never on the winning side once. You know, it's, it almost seems laughable, but, uh, well, it's a, it's a record that not too many people have. It? No, you're right, not that many tests anyway. <laughs> After five years away, Sutcliffe returned to our test ranks in 1965 and completed a century in the Calcutta Test, ten years after his first tour to India. I had myself a little cry privately because uh, never in my life before had I needed to prove to, to myself first, to my teammates, and to all those people back home who thought at 41 I was too old mm. to be playing test cricket that I still had it in me. Uh, and uh, that was a tremendous satisfaction in that one. Bert Suckoff, in contrast, was a classical left-hander. Tremendous strokes, lots of shakes, couldn't keep him quiet but he played it on a more orthodox manner and a uh, you know, very, very good left-handed batsman. The 
fond, the fondest memory is when uh, someone shakes you by the hand, really, and presents you with a New Zealand blaze and a cap with a silver fern on, and you put that on, you feel 10 feet tall. John Reid captained New Zealand a record 34 times, a natural rounder, he even deputised as wicketkeeper in three tests. Well, I think it was a period of about five years when I had John in my world, world 11 as the best all-rounder. There's nothing that guy couldn't do. Uh, he used to bat brilliantly, he bowled brilliantly, he fielded brilliantly anywhere, he was a great catcher. Um, he, could, he had so many strings to his bow, uh, he, he could win matches single-handed. And that's not given to many people, is it? No. As you, as you well know, uh, you know, you might have a strike force, but he can't do it all on his own, and suddenly you find somebody um, who's quite capable of doing it, and John Reid was that man. Reid moved to South Africa in 1981, where he coached first class in club cricket, but he returned home this year. Right. Throughout his career, he shouldered a heavy burden with both bat and ball because of the inexperience of his teams. In later years, in the, in the eight, 70s and 80s, there were up to six players who had test centuries, and that makes a tremendous difference to the, to the batting uh, length of any team. Um, you know, some people have been unkind enough to say I played one day cricket at test level, because I have hit a few sixes in my time, and, uh, but I had to watch that a bit, and I was very, co very conscious of the fact that I couldn't really have a go and throw my wicket away, although uh, I did on occasions. And how did he approach his role as an all-rounder? Well, I used to have an attitude where, being an all-rounder, if I failed with the ball, I was a batsman. And if I failed with a bat, I was a bowler. And I think that's what I tried to do. I tried to, to dedicate myself to the, to the job of whatever I was doing. I was an aggressive type of cricketer. New Zealand cricket was still very much an amateur operation, but talented players were on the scene. Players like Victor Pollard, Mark Burgess, the gritty and determined Bevan Congdon, all-rounder Bruce Taylor, batsman Brian Hastings, fast bowler Richard Collins and spinner Hedley Howarth, wicketkeeper Ken Wadsworth and 19 times test captain Graham Dowling. A young Worcester professional named Glenn Turner was also making his mark. Test victories were achieved in the late 1960s against India and the West Indies at home and against India in India, as well as our first away series victory in Pakistan in 1969. Also that year, fast bowler Dick Motts became the first New Zealander to take 100 wickets in Test cricket. The 1972 tour of the West Indies was notable for many fine individual performances, not the least being four double centuries by Glenn Turner including two in tests. In the fourth test, he scored 259 in a New Zealand test record partnership of 387 with Terry Jarvis, who scored 182. We weren't, we were not expected to win. In fact, we were expected to lose. And so when one reflects on it now, the fact that we drew that series, and it was a five test match series, uh, was a victory in a way for us. But the frustration that, that I had, and I'm sure some of the others had, is that invariably we were chasing large totals. So we were looking to save games. And the innings that I played uh, just became endurance affairs. And although, um, because I got some double hundreds and so on, um, I suppose it's fair to say I had some success, but they, weren't, they were not going towards a victory. And therefore the, 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 um, the enjoyment factor was limited because of that. And how did they get through such a long partnership? Uh, I suppose you have quite a lot of uh, mid-wicket conferences and, and Jav was always quite a good communicator out there. Um, and you would talk each other through it a little, you know, especially if you felt that you were getting to a vulnerable stage because you were, you were struggling with the heat and your concentration levels were dropping. Um, so, you know, we tended to get pretty used to each other. We probably spoke more to each other uh, during that innings than, uh, than at any other stage. Other major successes were Bevan Congdon with both bat and ball, and Bruce Taylor who took 27 wickets in the series including this dismissal of Gary Sobers. The name R.E. Redmond really smacks you in the eye when you look at the statistics of New Zealand Test cricketers. 
a batting average of 81.5, yet Redmond played only one test. In a glorious debut, he scored a century off only 110 balls, and in one over from Majid Khan, he scored not one. It's a full pass and four runs. <coughs> not two. Unfortunately, it was wide. There's his 50. Not three. And that's a beautiful shot. Or four. But five consecutive fours. It's away for four more. And soon after, he survived an over-exuberant crowd reaction. Crowd a little premature here. Redmond's on 99. But he won't be able to play on for some time as the crowd's milled all over the wicket. Then he was duly crowned as the King of Eden Park. Not at all happy with all the adulation. <laughs> Being lifted shoulder high now. I haven't seen this in cricket in New Zealand before. Then the next day, Brian Hastings with a century and Richard Collins set a world record 10th wicket partnership of 151 runs. Partnership worth 128. Three to establish a new record. Big hit from Collins. Collins' 68 not out is the highest score by a New Zealand number 11 in tests. The 1973 tour of England is best remembered for Glenn Turner's 1,000 runs before the end of May. One of those peculiar milestones cricket followers thrive on. Um, I didn't think much about it until it got very close and then the media made me <laughs> very conscious of it. The other players around me obviously got involved in it as well and therefore it became important to do. Um, and almost when it happened it was a great relief in a sense. But I suppose it was an interesting little touch in that, in that the guy that I actually got the thousand run from was Bishan Beatty. Because when he was bowling to me I thought well the Sikh's going to be my downfall. Now my wife's a Sikh, this guy with the putka or turban on is bowling to me now sort of thing. Turner. Needs just four more runs to become the only batsman since the war to score a thousand runs in May. Glenn Turner, four to go. But Turner duly followed Sir Donald Bradman in becoming the only other foreign player to achieve the feat. Turner has got his square bat shot, and there it is. He's, he's square cut at the weight of the fence. Four runs to Turner, and he's done it. The players of the Northampton side are clustering around him. Well, one of the most disappointing aspects of that whole whole episode was that I didn't then go on to have a very successful test series and and perhaps emotionally um, I, I was a little drained I mean it's, it's hard to work out but um, certainly my performance level did go down after that. New Zealand were unable to break their duck in tests against England but came oh so close. At Trent Bridge after being dismissed for 97 we fell only 38 runs short when chasing 478. Captain Bevan Congdon scoring 176 and Victor Pollard 116. Then at Lords we scored a massive 551 for nine declared, but couldn't bowl England out twice. For the first time though, New Zealand had three century makers in an innings. Congdon almost matched his Trent Bridge effort with 175. A magnificent drive, belted to reach the cover by Condon, giving the fieldsman no chance. Superb off drive. Mark Burgess got 105. <laughs> and Victor Pollard scored his second ton of the series. Bouncing away in front of the boundary and running to the ropes now. The following season, Australia agreed to official test matches against us for the first time since 1946. And Ripart is staying, Howard has taken a catch and he's been given out. 
Their indifference towards us was to provide ample motivation. We, we were literally snubbed by Australian cricket. They were playing test uh, series against all the other countries, but not New Zealand. And um, I didn't really want to feel as though I was second class, and I didn't think any of the other players on the side wanted to feel that either. And we'd been invited over to Australia on numerous, numerous occasions to play against their state sides as a national team. And I thought that it was rather humbling to have to tolerate. New Zealand led on the first innings thanks to a century by Glenn Turner, who after the second day had been left stranded on 99. Then Richard Collins and the Hadleys, a young tearaway named Richard and brother Dale, really took the attack to the Ockers. And there's no mistaking a slip catcher here, is there? New Zealand needed 228 to win in almost two days. And again, it was Turner who led the way, becoming the first New Zealander to score a century in each innings of a test match. Well, there it is. And the crowd rise to Turner. Has written himself in the history book today. It was wicketkeeper Ken Wadsworth who hit the winning runs and throughout the whole country people stopped to enjoy the moment. Tragically, Wadsworth was to die from cancer only two years later. And there it is. The test match is all over. New Zealand's first great victory. It was New Zealand cricket in a way coming of age, certainly in the eyes of the Australians. And that was important for us, I think. I can recall at that time, I think, that the chairman of the board wanted to give us a, a bonus. And that took us all by surprise. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, sure, we were pretty elated about it. Glenn Turner is the only New Zealander to score 100 first-class centuries. Many achieved during his county career with Worcester, but his professional attitudes to the game often had him at odds with administrators in this country and for a long time took him off the national scene. We were non-professional in, in most of our approach in this country at that time. And I thought I was very patient and I put up with a hell of a lot for a long time. Many would deny that, I'm sure. But I did, in my own mind I felt that I had done that. And you, one just gets to a point where you say, hey, that's enough, it doesn't make any sense, I'm not prepared to keep going along that path any longer. So you kick up a little bit of a fuss about it. I wish I was starting now, because it would have been a much smoother ride through, and I wouldn't have had all these scraps and disagreements. There wouldn't have been a need for them. Um, and, and therefore, I think it would have reflected more in my cricket, and I could have enjoyed it more. So yeah, I wish I could kick off again right now. Just give me a new body, would you? All sports have their special feats, and for cricket bowlers, Nirvana is the hat-trick, and Peter Petrick assured himself of a prominent place in our cricketing history by achieving the feat on his test debut against Pakistan in 1976. Incredibly, the hat-trick came at a time when his figures read naught for 96. Actually, Pete, tell us about those, uh, those three wickets that fell. In fact, I think we've got them up here if you want to have a quick look at them. Yes, yeah, certainly. The first guy, that's, uh, that's me and Dad, and I, you know, people in New Zealand will appreciate how great us uh, Kiwis feel, feel when we get rid of me and Dad. I think he was on a hundred or so at the time. What were you thinking at the moment? Uh, I was thinking about trying to get him out, or get one wicket at least, because they'd put on about 200 and, 280, I think, these two. Richard Hadley took the catch there? Yes, me and Dad played a pretty lazy shot. He'd been there a long time, and the ball did bounce an extra foot there, and that's probably why Top has it which uh, was starting to help us more than them. Always good to see the back of Javid Man, Dad. I mean, we've had problems for 10, 15 years trying to get that little fella out, haven't we? We certainly have. He was 19 there. My first game in first class, Greg, I think I bowled about 15 minutes before I got a wicket. Right. But I bowled there for about four hours. Yeah. So it was a relief to, to me and the team. And they put on, as you said, a couple of hundred. And the next guy out was, uh, who's this, Wasim Raja. He's a left-hander, yes, he... he 
to my amazement, he played a bad shot. He just hit it straight back to me. Straight back to the bowler, um, I was delighted, of course. <laughs> but it was a pretty forceful shot for a first shot in the test match. He was that kind of player, though, Roger, wasn't he? He'd go Certainly for anything, right. first up. Um, kind of player that would give you a chance at any stage. What's going through your mind now? I mean, is, is it hat trick? Hat trick? Yeah, it's most certainly going through my mind now. I think, well, we've got, we've got six wickets. Uh, certainly, I think you can see me standing at the back there walking around in circles, quite nervous about the whole thing. So you actually were nervous at this stage? I was um, probably excited. So you actually at this stage you're just looking to yeah. make him push forward and make him play the ball? Yeah, make him play it, and that, he definitely hit it. And that was a brilliant catch, absolutely brilliant. I, I actually appealed and turned to the umpire and he was unmoved. And I thought, I thought no. <laughs> uh, and then they actually into car ball. So, actually, at that stage where you made the appeal, you weren't confident at all, bearing in mind, of course, you were in Pakistan, that uh, you might not get the, the decision you wanted. Yeah, I might not get the decision, but uh, when I turned again, all the players were running at me, he, he definitely walked, which was pretty good of a Pakistani. <laughs> it was pretty rare for a Pakistani. And the, umpire, the umpire did give him out once he saw the back of him, but I don't think he was going to give him out if he had stayed there. That's probably the most rare form of uh, cricketing footage in the world, seeing a Pakistani walk off like that. Oh, I would think so. <laughs> yeah, I, think the, I think the most rarest thing is if I had got him out of LBW, that would have been real rare. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have much chance of that, mate. And the ball itself, did you get to keep it? Yes. Um, our manager then took it back to New Zealand and uh, the New Zealand Council mounted it on a cup for me. But unfortunately, when I was playing in Otago, the, the ball fell off the, off the mount and I gave it to the Otago Association. I haven't seen it since, which, which is quite annoying, really. A hat-trick at, you know, at the very top level to any bowler must be great. It must be you know, sort of like a hole-in-one to a golfer, wouldn't it? Uh, there's not a hell of a lot of people in the world that's got a hat-trick. And as you said, I think a hole-in-one would be a great way of describing a hat-trick in cricket because there has been a lot of bowlers who have two in a row but never achieved a third one. It's an achievement that I'll treasure and I'll never forget. When England toured early in 1978, few could have predicted the drama that would unfold in the first test. The first New Zealand led by 13 innings. runs on the first innings, but then collapsed to be all out for 123. All seemed lost. And I remember walking down the stairs with Richard Collins just taking the field uh, late on the, uh, the fourth day, I think it was. Uh, just after tea, and the crowd was sort of booing us, and they were saying, oh, typical New Zealand, you've let us down, and uh, it was disappointing to hear that. But it must have really got us riled up, because we needed that sensation. Boycott was the sensation, being uh, bowled by Collins for naught. And he's bowled him! What a magnificent start! <laughs> Wickets were to fall at regular intervals throughout the afternoon. And not a bit more in top Stephen Bock may not have got a bowl, but he did know how to join the party. Two men in front of the wicket on either side. And so a magic afternoon ended. Victory appeared a formality. A little bit of rain sort of okay. delayed uh, the process. We thought, goodness, we could be denied of this, uh, this great victory. But the cricket gods smiled. What a fine, that's the one they wanted. Again a stab. While Willis caught Jeff Howarth bolt Hadley, Hadley six for 26. England all out for 64 and 48 years of trying had ended on February 15th, 1978. Sharing that thrilling occasion with Hadley were Jeff Howarth and John Wright who'd scored 50 on his debut. All were to make huge contributions to New Zealand cricket in the 1980s. The celebrations were so great that John Parker, who was strictly teetotal, he in fact indulged, I think probably the only time he's ever drunk alcohol in his life, he indulged in a couple of um, glasses of champagne, so that shows how much the, <coughs> the victory went to the players. Wright's 50 came with the help of a charitable decision. Uh, Bob Willis opened the bowling with the wind behind his back. 
and uh, he bowled. Uh, I can remember the first ball because it was a pretty useful nut. It was it was a little bit short, about middle and leg, and um, went away a bit from me. And uh, there was a hell of an appeal behind the stumps. But as uh, the umpire, to his eternal credit, judged in my favour, <laughs> and then uh, I think I proceeded to thrill the the Basin Reserve spectators by racing to 55 in the day's play. The win created great excitement, but there were still low sceptics. We played in Christchurch the next test, and I went in to have a haircut. And I was sitting and waiting, uh, and there was a guy having his haircut, and the barber said to him, um, you know, wasn't that great about the, the cricket win against England, first ever, and, and the bloke said, oh, it's probably a bloody fluke. <laughs> <laughs> holding to Haworth. The Haworth years were about to begin and those sceptics were to become supporters. It was a time for New Zealand to end their apprenticeship the but the intended for. victims were not always that cooperative. Did it again. In Jeff Howe's Ball first pass. test as Catlin, New Zealand had the awesome West Indies pass. at their mercy, needing only 104 Ball runs to win in nearly five hours. But the visitors' bowlers had other ideas. He this and he's caught behind by Derek Murray. Cairns is out. The ninth New Zealand wicket down for 100. And all of a sudden we we're nine down, and Stephen Bock and, and Gary Troop, I think, were the last two, two guys in. And you know we still needed three runs to win, and it was very tense. They can tie or win this game as Garner comes in to Stephen Bock. Last ball of the over. It's up to him. They're looking for a leg by. There's indecision. It's coming to this end, but New Zealand have won! New Zealand have won this test match, the first test match against the West Indies. New Zealand stopped around about five o'clock that particular day. Anyway, we managed to scrape through on a leg by, and uh, uh, we were obviously overjoyed and jubilant about the whole thing. Unfortunately, the West Indies didn't uh, take too kindly to it. They thought they'd been hard done by by certain decisions and what have you it is, but basically it was, a, uh, it was just about a very bad sportsmanship and um, something that, you know, cannot be condoned and, um, and, and they deserved all they got for the, for the way they acted. They looked like sport brats, basically. The West Indies made few friends on that tour, with stump booting, umpire barging, well, he hit umpire Fred Goodall on his run-up, deliberate action, obviously. General indifference. And this has prompted Fred Goodall to move down to skipper Clive Lloyd. The West Indians... And extra long in tea breaks room. being in their repertoire. And there are some murmurs down below that they're refusing to come out because of an umpiring decision earlier on this afternoon. It's quite incredible, it really is. However, some decisions did seem rather harsh. Dangling in a little bit there. Maybe it'd be a little bit of deflection, who knows? And then we went on to, uh, to draw the next two test matches and so win the series. So obviously a great start as far as uh, my situation as captain was concerned, but also it was a very important, important start for, for New Zealand as a team because they'd learnt a bit, uh, a bit more about confidence and about winning. The 1980-81 tour of Australia made our players household names. The reason? One day cricket. What a catch! And the never to be forgotten third final at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. First there was Martin Sneddon's greatest catch that never was. And Greg Chapel is staying there. The umpires have said that's not out. And Howarth is having a word with umpire Cronin. Chapel went from 58 to 90 before Gary justice was finally done for Sneddon by Bruce Edgar. Greg Chapel plays one away and there's another one taken out there. Beautiful catch this time. Greg Chapel's on his way. What a magnificent catch. Then Edgar led New Zealand to within sight of victory. There he goes, well played Bruce Edgar, what a fine hand, congratulations to him, he's going back for the second and he gets it. Edgar 101, 52,000 people in front of their seats. Well it did keep very low. 
hitting a six at the Melbourne Cricket Ground is no easy feat, but there was a feeling that if anyone could produce a miracle, then Brian McKechnie could. In 1978, he'd helped the All Blacks to a Grand Slam on the tour he was not even originally selected for. Pushed out of the lineup, the big New Zealand lock board, and this could be the kick of the decade for Brian McKechnie. Now he had to try and win another game on another tour he was not originally selected for. And how was he feeling at the time? Well, before that, I was feeling relaxed because I thought you were going to do the job for me. <laughs> yeah, good one, mate. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I mean, walking down there, I think, in your mind, you think, God, you know, 6-1 six, six ball at Melbourne of all grounds. But the chapels were already plotting. Well... It looks to me as if they're going to bow underarm off the last ball. Rod Marsh is saying no, mate, but I'm sure he's going to bow an underarm delivery. At that stage, I just didn't know what to do. I mean, I just froze sort of thing, you know. I mean, never ever contemplated that was going to happen. They're going to bow an underarm. We have believed it. And that's a disappointing finish. Disappointed Brian McKechnie, the crowd boo. It's all over. The only thing I thought of, well, I'm not going to be embarrassed by getting bowled by this damn thing. So Brian McKechnie's last act in international cricket was in fact a throw a bat. I've seen very few people who can hit sixes at Melbourne. Um, and often they haven't hit it first ball. Most times it hasn't been first ball. I didn't give myself a chance in hell. But it, what it did was deny the opportunity to have a go. Right. Have you ever thought uh, if you had to do it again at some stage, what kind of method you might use to do it? I guess afterwards I did. Um, and I thought, when you think about it later, I thought, well, you know, you can flick it up with your foot. Why the hell didn't you do that 11 years ago? Who the hell are you telling me about tactics? Oh, you know that. That particular incident was the best thing that ever happened to New Zealand cricket. And I'm very grateful for Greg Chappell to, um, to instruct his brother Trevor to do it. So, and I think New Zealand is probably very grateful, even though it did cause, obviously, a great stir in the, um, uh, at, at the time it happened. Everyone got in on the act. Then Prime Minister Robert Muldoon said it was appropriate the, the Australians were wearing them. yellow. Cricket would never be the Go same again. Down. India was beaten in 1981 and a series drawn with Australia the following year thanks to a marathon innings of 161 by Bruce Edgar. That's it. Four runs to Bruce Edgar. He's 103, his third test century. Morrison to Border. He hits it in the air and he's caught by Howard. Australia are all out for 280. New Zealand have to score 104 runs to win the Test match. New Zealand, just one to win this Test match. And it was finished in style. Headley goes for it. It's over the top. And it's six, and New Zealand have won. New Zealand and we were getting victories off the field as well. You've always been regarded as a bit of a prankster in the New Zealand side. Is it true that you once stuck Prawns and Rod Marsh's wicket keeping gloves? Yeah, yeah, it is actually. Um, <laughs> it was a pretty silly thing to do. Um, yeah. Um, could have been worse, could have been Dennis Lilly's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't that silly. Uh, yeah, um, Rodney didn't open those gloves. He wore in purse and he opened his bag with the prawns and his wicket keeping gloves three days later in Sydney. And by all accounts, they, they, uh, they were pretty ripe um, from some of his teammates. Um, I'm making one or two uh, suggestions about Rod Rodney's uh, odour. Um, he didn't talk to me for about 10 days. I, I've, I'd forgotten about it until, um, you know, someone said, God, Marshy's, you know, Marshy's hacked off. And I knew, he, he either knew it was me or Kenzie. And uh, <laughs> when we batted, I could remember, I could, you know, I w Rod walked past me and I went to talk to him and he just, you know, I could have been a brick wall and all I could smell was Ajax and rotten prawns. 
<laughs> it was World Series cricket that again captured the public's imagination in 1983. No. Two balls remaining. He's bowled it well, the three for one early. Dear, oh dear. Look at Howarth, he's working overtime. What a skipper under pressure this man's proved to be over recent years. Vic Marks is the batsman, the final delivery of this great match. He's bowled it! Then in Adelaide, a 121-run partnership by Jeremy Coney and Richard Hadley gave us an unlikely victory. Oh, and he's got him away, and that's four. Or is it? It's Randall diving, and it's four, yes, and that's a vital one. They must have been on their knees at the break, New Zealand, chasing 296. Tremendous team performance to date. Three runs, eight deliveries, four wickets in hand. Englishman charging in, left the two eight. That's a good hit, that'll be it. Down the ground, they're through for one. Cover A chasing, two, three, four in New Zealand, three and they've won. Look at Jeremy Coney, look at the New Zealand missing him. And why not one of the all-time great performances, Jeremy Coney. The finals were lost, but Lance Cairns was to become a uh, folk hero. I think Australia got a huge score. And we got there to chase it, and the next thing we're about six down for 30-odd. You know, we're right out of it. And um, so I get out there with Wally Lees, and... Lily bowls me a bounce the first up, hits me in the head. Um, no, not good. So I went down to Wally and said, bugger this well. In or out. So um, I decided to have a bit of a go at it. And it's one of those times, you know, that a few got connected in the middle and away they went. He's got hold of it. It's a big one. It races out over the square leg fence. What a magnificent hit. He's gone again. It's going to have a massive hit. That's right into the members. That's... 15 metres back there. And he's still going at it, and that's an enormous hit. In fact, I think that one's gone further than the one that he hit off Ken McClay. Yeah. McClay going back, and he won't go back far enough. It's into the stands again. So that's the onside field placing for Lily. And that one was bowled outside the leg stump. He's got hold of it and lofted it over the fine leg fence. Going some 10 rows back into the crowd and that's the fifth six for Lance Cairns. This is unbelievable. Backs off again and thrashes that one and that's Claire Graham Woods headed mid off. There's the sixth one. And so began the legend of Excalibur. Not a sword, but a bat used with frightening strength. I know what people wanted from me, what they expected of me when I walked out there to bat. Um, it, no, it, the thing that, once again, I, um, I play my game a certain way, especially the one-day game, and if, if I connect and hit the ball right, I hit it. But I'm not going out there to please the public sort of thing. But he did. Oh. <laughs> that, that's almost at the airport. To Cairns. Dance down the wicket. Randall's underneath this one, but it's over at the top of him at six. And he found an unusual rival. Turn a high in the air, this is over the top, and six. What a fine shot. There it is, into the road. <laughs> One, two, three bounces, and away it goes. I went from, if you like, being criticised for, for blocking to at the end, or towards the end of my career, I was accused of giving it away and playing in too swashbuckling a manner. In fact, Lance Cairns actually mentioned that he felt that I was going over the top with my aggression and I thought, ah, I've made it then. <laughs> After beating Test newcomer Sri Lanka, we headed to England determined to win a test time. there for the first time. And it was Lance Cairns, the bowler, who did the damage at Headingley. And he's gone. Lance Cairns has struck again. into the in-swing or the out-swing into the left hand with three slips. And he's bowled him. Six wickets for Cairns. What a field day he's having. He's hoisted that away to a long leg. Is it going to be taken? Uh, yeah, very safely pouts. And that is seven wickets for Lance Cairns. Solid batting by John Wright with 93. He's done it in good style this time. Bruce Edgar, 84. Short on the offside is made sure this time. That's four runs. 
and Richard Hadley 75 gave us a 152 run lead. Then Ewan Chatfield with five wickets and Lance Cairns with three and ten for the match set up the victory. Oh, that kept low, almost ran along the ground. And he's caught it, beautifully caught, low down by Crow. And that's it. First ball for me and Botham brings the four runs. And New Zealand have won their first ever test match in England. I, I did a lot of work at times for very little reward. And when you do get the big payday, you, know, you really enjoy it. And I think that, that night, after we'd won the test, it was a huge, huge night. And uh, we all enjoyed it. But it's a thing that probably sort of um, gets me a little bit that with the batting side of it, people sort of remember me for those sixes. And then the bowling side of it's sort of forgotten about. And um, I thought I did quite well for the type of bowler I was in the uh, test arena. But not only the victory became a talking point. Well, I think apart from winning the game, I think the main thing was that Richard Hadley got no wickets, <laughs> which is, uh, what, you know, it didn't happen very often. Uh, and we had a few after the game, I can remember that, I can remember <laughs> much the next day. For the English pros in the side, it was a major breakthrough. Yeah, it was a great feeling, particularly I remember sitting next to Jeff House and, and Jeff and I were both professionals in England. And in many ways, you know, New Zealand cricket, we did, you know, I played with a South African over there and his opinion was always more relevant than mine. And I think, you know, that, that no one, you know, they, they thought we could play, but they didn't really think that, you know, we, we, we were a really good cricketing side. And, and just to, to beat England on English soil, you know, it was fantastic. I remember Jeff saying, um, I think we were both on our 20th fag, sort of. <laughs> He said, I, I don't care what happens as long as we win that one. And those who had gone before also shared in the moment. I can remember, I think, almost a tear in the eye of one Walter Hadley uh, at Headingley yeah. back in 1983. Yeah, it was there. <laughs> don't worry about that. More than in the eye, it came down the cheek. <laughs> the series was lost, but an important milestone was achieved. And the following year, a series was won when we beat England by an innings. Richard Hadley's 99 off only 81 deliveries, being a higher score than England managed in either of their turns at bat. Oh, that's a nice shot from Richard Hadley. He managed to elude Derek Randall in the covers. Four runs to Hadley. In 1985, we found an unlikely batting hero in Ewan Chatfield, whose skills with a willow had once almost killed him and ended a test match. You know, that wasn't the one I got disconned, was it? That's the one we're asking you about. <laughs> Well, it was one of these things that uh, we were nine down, I think, and, and uh, Jeff Houth and I were going to try and bat all day. Um, it was due to rain later on in the day, but I think in the end it never did. Um, and I was just hanging around, being a bit of a nuisance, I suppose, as number 11s can be. And uh, Peter Lever thought it was about time he got rid of me, one way or another. Um, and, you know, I, don't, I don't, honestly don't think it was a, a bouncer. It was just a, a short pitch ball that I didn't quite pick up, and, it, and I think it came off the top of my glove Jeff or my Hill. handle of it. Uh, on the bat up. and just ricocheted in the side of my head. On the left hand side of the face. Chat's light heartedness belies the true situation. Bernard Thomas, the then uh, English physio, he came up to the ground and, and immediately diagnosed uh, Ewan Chatfield had swallowed his tongue. And like I said, we didn't know anything about the, know anything about this. And by this time he was turning blue, I couldn't watch anymore because he was just turning blue, he was throttling in the mouth, and he was really struggling to breathe. So it was lucky Bernard Thomas came because um, it was just that sort of instant, apparently, and I found out later, that um, you and Chatfield sort of stopped breathing for a couple of seconds because they, we didn't react quick enough to getting his tongue out and giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, which is indeed what Bernard Thomas did. In 1985 it was Lance Cairns who could have quoted a former world boxing champion who said, honey I forgot to duck after one defeat. Oh and Lance Cairns has been hit very hard indeed on the head. Akram fired it in short, Lance Cairns turned away. I think probably after a blow like that he should sit down for a short while at least. Brendan Bracewell came and went and when Chats joined Jeremy Coney 51 runs were needed. Then there was controversy. Well, they were getting at me, of course, they were getting a bit uptight because they, you know, we were, I think we were one up in the series at that stage and they were, we were nine down and they couldn't get, couldn't, couldn't get us out, either Jerry or I. Uh, yeah, there was, and of course there was even more when, when Fred got into the game about bowling uh, short pitch balls that uh, hit the number 11. Uh, you know, there's a few times I got hit on the head and things, and they were getting up at Fred 
a little bit about it. But yeah, um, the awards are verbal, and I, you know, I dare say if we were in the same situation, we'd be giving a, giving a bit of verbal as well. I can take him. I can take him off. Eventually, if he continues to do it, and by God, we will. Okay, then we'll go off. Right? Then it's up to you. No. Oh. That's a warning. That's an official warning. Once again, could you say well? Me and Dad doesn't want to know about it. I was a wreck. You know, I don't know whether you saw me at tea time, but, you know, I never drink tea or coffee at any time of the day. And I hear I was trying to drink tea at, 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 at afternoon tea time. And I never got a sip because all of it ended up on the floor in the, in the, in the saucer. And, I, you know, I was just shaking that much. It was unbelievable. Then a bit of luck. And that's Edge. And dropped. But through it all, grit right. and determination. It's a way through mid-wicket. They'll certainly get two. They'll be looking for three. No, they're content to take two, and that's Jeremy Cohn is 100. Well, nicely turned by Chatfield. This could be four. Indeed, it is four. Facing Nakash. Yes. Works it away on the onside. This is one run. Are they going to come back for the second? Here comes the throw from Harpies. They're home, and New Zealand have won the test match. I couldn't get off the field fast enough and get into that dressing room because, you know, I was just absolutely gone. Uh, emotional, you know, it was, it was just when Jerry hit that winning run, I just, uh, it was a magical piece of time, really. It was an afternoon I'll never forget Stockley, you know, and, and if anybody these days asks me the highlight of my career, it's got to be that, because I think that I did something that is not my, my normal thing in cricket. Would you have gone out to bat had you been required? Yes, I'd, well, I, I, was, I was crook, I was real crook, and um, I got up from out of there and I went outside and sat down in the tunnel. Uh, yeah, I was prepared to go out there, but I, would, I wouldn't have made the middle, but I, was, uh, I would have given them the go. Today, Chet still plays cricket, and what about that helmet? And it's still there now, mate, and I still wear it everywhere I go today. <laughs>The 1985 tour to the West Indies was Jeff Howarth's last. Our most successful captain ever was not happy. I asked for a, an explanation when, when it was first um, told to me that I was, gonna, I was dropped. And none was forthcoming. And uh, I felt that very strange, like I said, the fact that I'd been the captain for five years and a reasonably good one. I, th I think I could have done better, or they could have treated me a little bit better by giving me an explanation. Uh, than, than what they did by the, 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 the chairman of selectors in Frank Cameron didn't say a word. He left memories of a class batsman. There's one of them at least. Down to third man. They're going for two. This could be close, but Howarth's home. There's his hundred. Jeffrey Howarth, 100. And a fine leader on and off the field. Just his eye towards the scoreboard. Today, Howarth lives in England and the former Surrey professional has definite views on how county cricket helped the New Zealand scene. What we gained in one year was equivalent to playing sort of three to five years in New Zealand. That's the amount of cricket we are playing over here, the type of cricket we are playing, the cricketers that we were playing against. One year's experience in England was equivalent to five, three to five years in New Zealand. And so our game progressed much quicker, and we, we matured um, much quicker than, than perhaps a New Zealand born and not, not a New Zealand, New Zealand based player and the experience that we brought back with us I think was had a, had a profound effect. The summer of 1985-86 was one of the sweetest ever for the team and the maestro Richard Hadley. New Zealand won a series in Australia. That's beautifully taken, he has got good hands. Hadley took 33 wickets. He's out, first ball after lunch, he's driven on the up to cover. Including 15 at the Gabba. It's gone, yes, beautiful piece of bowling. Nine in the first innings. Oh, oh and that's got to be very close, I would say. That's out, yes. Oh, and right through him. Oh, and he's gone through Phillips as well. It's gone. Great catch. He's gone, yes, nine wickets. What a wonderful performance from Richard Hadley. One of the all-time great performances at the Gabba. His teammates must congratulate the great fast bowler. You probably try and look for the, the near-perfect performance in one's career, mm. and you may never even get that far. I mean, it's probably so far beyond uh, comprehension. Well, that particular test match was as close as I could get to it, I guess.
and nine wickets for 52, a New Zealand uh, record obviously, and I caught the other fella out. And uh, so to get on the score sheet ten times, I think only Jim Lake would probably be the only other player to ever done that. And of course, we all know that he took 19 wickets in the Test match, and that's unlikely to ever be uh, repeated, let alone uh, bettered. And then a brilliant partnership of 224 between John Reid and Martin Crow set up a decisive advantage. There it is, and what a way to bring it up! A beautiful straight drive, slightly on the onside and his third test century. A beautiful hundred. Fist clenched above his head, Jeremy Coney. And there's the hundred for John Reid. Very quickly through for the first and back for the second. Good performance from John Reid, test century number six. Well, I do rate it still as my best ever knock in test cricket. Um, probably more the way I, I went about it. Um, I was able to play my shots and I felt as though um, it, you know, I was dictating terms. Um, so it was an unusual really to, to be able to produce my best, but someone like Richard Hadley of course up, up that and, um, and completely stole the limelight. And he's got him right through him and that makes it six in the second innings, 15 for the match and New Zealand have won by an innings and 41 runs. To beat Australia by an innings on their home soil for the first ever time was magic. I mean, it's always nice to beat Australia at any time, but that again helped set up a Test Series victory. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was the greatest New Zealand performance, in my opinion, the near perfect Test match. And while some individuals had some great performances, it was still a good team uh, performance all round. I think uh, we thoroughly deserved it under the captaincy of Jerry Coney, of course, and, uh, and the coaching of, uh, of Glenn Turner. When the Australians returned to New Zealand, they found John Bracewell, the fast bowler trapped in a spin bowler's action, in no mood for messing. Back goes the off stump, John Bracewell strikes again. Oh, catch it! It's an appeal for a catch and Bruce Reed is out. And then for the first time, we won a series in England. Beautifully bowled. Thanks to a brilliant all-round effort by Richard Hadley at his home away from home, Trent Bridge. Oops, he's bowled him. And the batting of John Bracewell. Oh, he's hit that magnificently. Like lightning, it goes away the boundary. It's small to Bracewell. He makes it. He makes it. Well played, John Bracewell. A maiden test century, not without heartache, but agony, and I'm sure that was shared by all his teammates. The years since have been a mixture. We've had home wins over the West Indies, India and Australia and achieved a prize win in India. This catch against the West Indies was probably the turning point at Lancaster Park in Jeremy Coney's last test. Oh, well alright I suppose, the bowling of Chats, Paddles and Sneds and the batting of Martin Crow may have helped, but they've already featured haven't they? The West Indian captain is out, marvellous catch. A win in India is a prized possession for a New Zealand cricketer and John Wright remembers well the day he led his team to victory. It was an incredible afternoon. Uh, it was a big crowd, Sunday crowd, and Braces bowled magic. He got a, you know, he got, um, he got a wicket just before tea. He got uh, Sidhu and Vinsaka just before tea and then we started to have him on the ropes. I remember catching Capital Dev and, and Jonesy ran all the way from third man to, to, to pat me on the back, it's something he's never done and, and uh, it was a great feeling of, of unity, uh, positive and, and it was hard and uh, great, great memories. Into the air, he could be out caught. Chatfield under it, and that's it. New Zealand have defeated India. I found it quite ironical to think that the very day that we looked like we were going to win, our beer arrived from home. Yeah, and, and I think um, Ken Dees, the manager, bought the most uh, expensive bottle of champagne that probably New Zealand Cricket Council's ever paid for. <laughs> Don't know what champagne cost in India, but it was a few rupees. Um, oh, I think we got past those little, um, you know, the, we got over those difficulties and, and managed to um, enjoy the win, um, you know, it, because it was, it, was a, it was a good side and, and I think any New Zealand cricketer that's ever toured Pakistan or India um, really, uh, you know, sometimes those are the tours you talk of when, when you 
the sides do become very strong in team spirit. I, I love my tours of Pakistan and India. He never, he was never ever afraid of anybody, any batsman. Oh, and he's gone right through his defence. Border a good bat. He probably timed the ball better than anyone on the team batting wise. Oh, a glorious shot from Richard Hadley. Richard Hadley was the best cricketer to play with. He was the one that uh, set us up for, for most of our victories. Edge. Obviously bowling, it was just a matter of turning up for him. Someone really quick. Both of them would be looking for one. And there's Saw. Has he caught it? Yes, he has. At Gully, Willie, you know, took some amazing catches. He's a brilliant cricketer. To guard. Oh, yeah. oh the marvellous catch again! It's Richard Hadley! And he's got knighthood as well, so I suppose he must be good. <laughs> So he could bet, could he? Well, if it was up, it was off. <laughs> if it was short, I'd be in some difficulty, to say the least. <laughs> Set us up for most of our victories. Just a matter of turning up at the office. What about Michael Whitney? Here it comes, last ball of the test. Australia have done it. They've won the series, well played, Mike Whitney. Why couldn't you get Whitney out that day? <laughs> well, that, that's a point. I mean, I had six balls at him, didn't I? And any, anything I bowled straight, he kept out. Anything yeah. was just a little bit outside the off stump. You played and missed, and actually, it could have got, got you another catch. Yeah, it well, could have got me that much closer, <laughs> couldn't it, to, uh, to the world record. Sir Richard Hadley, the holder of the world record for most Dr. test wickets. Yes, that's 100. Bowling to Alan Border. Shout for LBW, and the wicket has been taken. Richard Hadley equals Ian Botham's world record of 373 test wickets. And that's the world record. W, and will that be a wicket for Richard Hadley with his last ball in Test cricket? To join a very select group of players who have done that. Significant for me, and I think very important for New Zealand cricket, because when you look at world record sort of thing in, in cricket, you start looking at the English, you start looking at the Australian players, but little old New Zealand was starting to feature, and uh, I think that was a great part of history for us. Great cricketer, no doubt, but he needed his mates every now and then, didn't he? But seriously, simply the best. Magnificent delivery. Right, Richard, I mean, you've got a reputation for being a great statistician. I mean, you know, you, you look forward to so many marks. I'm going to test you. I've got a bit of a Peter Sinclair quiz here for Why? you, OK? Why? We'll just see how good you are, all right? <laughs> Who's your first test wicket? First one was Assie Vickbill at Wellington, 73. Hundredth? Hundredth would be Imran Khan at Napier in 79. Two hundredth. Norman Cowns, uh, Trent Bridge in 83, um, I think it was, yes. 246. Pass. 300. 300, Alan Border at Wellington in 86. 373. 373, Dynamite, I think it was, uh, at Melbourne in 86. 374. 374, Aaron Lowell, Bangalore in 88. 400. Mandraker here at uh, Lancaster Park in uh, 1990, I think it was. Who was your last one? And he was a toughie, wasn't he? He was a toughie. Devin Malcolm, actually, LBW no score. In fact, he faced six balls in that match. He got a pair and asked me to sign his run chart. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I give up. The answer to the past question was, well, who really cares? And Dottomade was Melbourne in 1987. Oh, well, he has retired, hasn't he? But like so many young Canterbury lads, Sir Richard's love of cricket was nurtured at Lancaster Park. I used to come down here and collect bottles <laughs> and uh, take them into the shop and get about tuppence for so I could buy an ice cream. Yeah. But I also sold uh, the programs here at the ground and I worked up on the scoreboard as well. And you often look down from the scoreboard and think, well, one day, wouldn't it be great to actually be playing a first-class game or a test game uh, for Canterbury or New Zealand or Lancaster Park? But he did have an advantage, a cricketing family that boasted three other internationals. He had a uh, very distinct natural ability when he was a little boy, uh, say um, from the age of seven or eight onwards. 
and um, he just loved playing cricket and he loved talking, uh, being a bit of a private broadcaster and all this sort of thing, but it was always about cricket or rugby. It was pro cricket with Nottinghamshire that was the real turning point. It's like any job, if you do it six days a week, you get into good habits, good disciplines and good routines. And so really English cricket fine-tuned me as a better player, as a near-perfect player. And uh, really it, it made me a, a pretty useful bowler. What an understatement that is. The standard is now set. And I think that the confidence is there, the direction is there, I think the coaching structure is right, uh, the opportunity for younger players is certainly there. But at the end of the day, it's up to those players who are now given the opportunity to represent New Zealand. Let's hope it is the start of a great era. But I'll, I'll be a little bit hesitant yet to say, you know, we've got to have a, we're going to have a great side coming through this year and next year. I mean, I'd, I'd prefer to look in about two years' time. We do have athletes of, of great natural ability. And um, I, we, I think we've always got the, the ability to produce players in this country. I think we are going through a, re, re, a rebuilding stage. I mean, there's people like yourself, Smithy, are you a young gun mate? Um, and one or two others, I mean, young righty. But, you know, we've had a, a big turnover just recently. Um, and I think that that's still going to continue. We've still got a sorting out to be done, I think. We were lucky that when we started off that we actually had four English pros playing in our team uh, where the guys today haven't got anybody and I think that's going to be the hard uh, thing that Martin Crowe's got is to try to get the, get the professionalism through the side. The Young Guns, the future of New Zealand cricket, are led by Martin Crowe. Nicknamed Hogan after the TV character in Hogan's Heroes because of his leadership qualities, Martin Crowe has been a New Zealand player since 1982 when he made a horror beginning against Australia. He gets a neck and a good, caught by Woods. But he was always destined for the top and has since been called the greatest white batsman in the world. That's the best shot we've seen of the innings. What is it about great players like Richard Hadley and Martin Crowe that set them apart from the rest? Well, I'd, I'd probably stick my neck out and say that um, it probably just comes from so far deep in and, and Richard came from a cricketing family and so did I and we were just brought up um, just loving to play the game and loving to do well. And uh, we knew the history of the game, we knew what we were basically taking the place of, we knew what was ahead. And I think that that sort of feeling stays with us um, 24 hours a day and, and that's, that's why we love playing it. In 1991, Crow had his biggest payday to date in partnership with the amazing Andrew Jones, who scored the first of a record three successive hundreds. There from Jones and this brings up his hundred. Laps it away, this will be his 200. Completes the one and comes back for the second. And that's a double century for Martin Crow. Here's a soak and a silver bowling to Andrew Jones who plays a beautiful shot for four. And there's the world record. These two players have now scored more runs together than any other two in test history. It's a great thing to be a part of because it's something you can never think about doing. It just happens, it just comes along because you can't plan to score four, six, seven together. And uh, we worked really well in that partnership. And the great thing about it was that we didn't get a run out between us. <laughs> that was an achievement. That's probably a world record in itself. And that's the record. Through the gap, that's four. More runs in an individual innings than any New Zealand test batsman. Uh, I set my sights that day of getting to that uh, particular score of 260 and I felt totally in control in doing it. But um, if I can perhaps go on and say that when I came to the, the 290s and going to 300, I had no idea uh, how I was really going to do it because I'd never even thought about it. He's caught! He's caught! Staggering! It's interesting look, thinking about that, that 299, that near 300, was that I stood there before the bowler came in the bowl thinking that I'd already done it and I was thinking about the pats on the back and the glory that came with it and the accolades and what have you and I forgot to turn on to the next ball and yet for 10 hours I had done it previously. But there is always another day. I would like to think that he will go through in the coming season and not just do well for, for New Zealand in scoring a number of runs but actually win some games for us. He's conscious that until now he hasn't done it often enough. And, and so 
I reiterate, I think we're yet to see the best of Martin Crow. How do you view the future as captain of the Young Guns? It's going to be tough. Um, we've got a lot of hard work ahead, but I think, you know, if we, if we sort of set our goals properly, I think in three or four years we're going to have a very strong side. It's just that time where uh, we've got to let those young guys come in and, and settle in, and then uh, I think the future looks good because there is some great talent out there. I'm very keen for us to make the semi-finals and, and, and play at Eden Park, and who knows from that point on whether we can go on to, to win the World Cup. But um, there are other World Cups, hopefully, in my career as well, and I would like to think that I could retire with uh, a near World Cup win or even a World Cup victory for New Zealand. But the last word belongs to John Wright, the oldest young gun and the veteran of 20 test victories since 1978. One of the game's great triers, Wright led New Zealand to three victories between 1988 and 1990, the last against Australia at the Basin Reserve. In many ways, New Zealanders in New Zealand against Australia, uh, I think we've always performed uh, with that, that bite and that edge against the Aussies. Um, it, it brings sometimes the best out in us, particularly in New Zealand, because we always fancy you know, our chances. And to beat him was, um, you know, it's a good feeling. County cricket with Derbyshire made him mentally tough, but it had its negative side as well. You know, you, you always want to enjoy the game, but, you know, after a 17 or day stint or, and you're at Bradford on a, on a cold day and there's two men and a dog watching, you know, <laughs> you'd, you'd probably rather not be there sometimes. What's your fondest memory of your long international career? Well, uh, the guys, really. Um, you know, you could pick wins out here and there. Bombay meant a lot, and of course, you know, the basin when you're captaining or winning in England. I mean, you know, that was that was great. But you know, really, uh, we've had a lot of laughs. Uh, you play for your country. You're in a, a great environment with you know, 12, 15 if you're on tour, maybe more guys, New Zealanders, who are really trying, you know, pushing themselves. To do, to do something, to achieve something, and, and uh, you go through highs and lows, and, and um, you know, I've met some good people, and to experience losing, that's not great, and then to experience uh, the wins, it's fantastic, you know, uh, great feeling, you, you know, I'll never really ever get that again, I don't think. It gives me satisfaction that I set out to, to try and play cricket for New Zealand, and um, you know, I've, I've played and I've managed to help, you know, I've been part of it.